Welcome to the Rehab Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Tom Walters. Today is our first solo episode. I'm really excited about these solo episodes as they will allow me to go deeper into specific types of pain and injuries. A lot of the topics people know me for on my current content on Instagram and YouTube. In this first episode, since it's the first solo one, I really want to start by covering the treatment framework that I use with patients. This is something I also cover and outline in my book, and I think it's really important and helpful whether you're a practitioner or you're someone who has pain or an injury. Understanding how a physical therapist treats pain and injury is kind of the process and the model that we use to work through these um, types of symptoms can be helpful um, no matter what type of problem you are facing. So I think really covering this is going to help you if you've got something going on right now or you have an injury or a pain issue come up in the future, as most of us will, knowing how kind of having a plan in place uh, for how to work through these different problems can be really helpful. We know that pain and injury often cause anxiety and fear and cause people to really become apprehensive and to stop doing the things they enjoy. And Oftentimes, when you completely stop doing things, other problems can come. You might lose mobility. Uh, you can develop certain conditions um, in the body that are related to, you know, just totally halting from movement. And um, so we're losing mobility. We can lose strength. We can lose neuromuscular control and stability in our joints. So while there is a place for temporary rest, we really want to have a plan to keep the body moving. We have more and more research showing that when we keep moving, it really helps to prevent different impairments from developing and deconditioning that happens in the body. And ultimately, if you completely stop moving, the pain system can become more sensitive. So we just want to have a plan. Really, as a physical therapist, besides implementing, you know, prescribing therapeutic exercises to patients and maybe providing some manual therapy, some hands-on work when people have pain, most of what I do is sort of serving as a pain coach. People are coming in with symptoms. They don't really know how to move forward. And a lot of what I do is sort of talking with people, understanding their situation, again, giving them, you know, different exercises and strategies to implement, but really helping them just navigate the overall process. And a lot of that is what I'm going to share in this episode. It's this framework, this treatment framework that it can apply to all pains and injuries. So let's get started. So this is really going to be kind of a three-phased approach. And this is really kind of the foundation of all orthopedic physical therapy in a way. This is a lot of how I was trained in physical therapy school. And I probably just use slightly different terms now and have distilled it down a little bit in my own current system. But what we're going to do is look at three basic steps. And the first one is going to look at reducing pain and sensitivity. So pain is the number one symptom anyone will come into a practitioner's office for. It's the thing most people are concerned about when they come into physical therapy. They're really, in most cases, hoping to get rid of pain. So obviously there are other goals in there too. If someone has reduced mobility or strength um, or they're having a difficult time with things in life, they're going to wonder about those things too. But most of the time it's a concern about how do I get rid of pain. So the first phase um, here really when we're thinking about treating pain or injuries is to reduce pain and sensitivity. And there are different ways we can go about that. And I'll cover, get into some of those as we go along, just to give kind of an overview. So that would be the first phase. And then phase two will be addressing impairments. So we're looking at any kind of deficits that might exist in the musculoskeletal system. So in physical therapy, this is really what we are measuring. These are sort of the objective measures that we're going through when patients come in. So we might ask them about their pain. Maybe we rank their pain on a zero to 10 scale. If you've ever been to physical therapy, you will have probably had a physical therapist ask you to rank your pain on that zero to 10 scale. After that, when we're looking at impairments, these are things that we can measure. So range of motion is one of the primary ones. So looking at the affected joints and in physical therapy, we'll use a goniometer. It's called, it's kind of a little tool with arms And that allows us to measure uh, the person's range of motion. We can look at passive range of motion. So how far can the joint be moved? If say myself as a physical therapist, I'm moving maybe their arm, moving their shoulder, and then active range of motion, how far can the patient move on their own? We will look at things like balance, coordination, uh, motor control is one maybe you've heard of. Motor control is sort of the quality of movement. So just looking at not necessarily how strong the person is, but how well can they coordinate 
and move the joints involved in a particular movement or task. And this has elements of strength and balance and coordination, but it's a term that you might hear in physical therapy, this motor control aspect, or you might think of it as neuromuscular control. So sort of that interaction between your nerves, your brain, your nervous system is sending motor impulses out from your motor cortex. That is those, those signals are going down to the relevant muscles and your fi those muscles are contracting to control joints. So if you're looking at something like your knee, if you had a meniscus injury or a ligament injury, say an ACL tear, and you're, you are working on maintaining control of that knee joint, well, your brain has to send motor impulses down to your quadricep muscles, your hamstring muscles, even muscles that are somewhere else in the kinetic chain, like the calf, the glute muscles. And so we could look at someone doing a task, maybe a single leg squat. So you might have someone do a single leg squat, and we're just looking at just visually how well can they control that movement, which again has elements of balance, coordination. It's a loop between your sensory system and your motor system. So you've got information coming from your proprioceptors and mechanoreceptors from the tissues of your body into your brain and spinal cord, and then a motor output going back out. And that is that whole loop that we as physical therapists call motor control. So I often just tell people, this is just sort of the quality of your movement. How, what does the quality of your movement look like? Um, so we're, those are kind of the main impairments in phase two. We really want to look at range of motion, motor control, balance. Strength is technically also an impairment, and we will start some strength work in phase two, um, kind of this middle stage of rehab programs. But really, that'll come in the last phase, which I call rebuilding capacity. And capacity is your ability to basically carry out tasks throughout your day, generate force. Um, it's um, sort of the maximum potential for a given tissue. So if you think about maybe something like a muscle strain, if you strain a muscle and you're going through the rehab process, eventually, you know, that we can measure the force capacity of your muscle tissue. How much force can it generate before it maybe suffers another strain? And phase three, this last phase of the rehab process for almost every pain or injury focuses around resistance or strength training. And really the goal there is to rebuild capacity. If you increase the capacity of your musculoskeletal tissues, whether it's tendon, muscle, bone, ligament, whatever it is, those tissues become mechanically more resilient, which means they're then less likely to, you know, to be injured again in the future. So those are kind of the three steps, just an overview of them. We're going to go from reducing pain and sensitivity in phase one In phase two, we'll look at addressing impairments, especially mobility and motor control and early strength impairments. And then phase three will be all about rebuilding capacity with resistance training, that strength training side of things. So when we look at that first phase, reducing pain and sensitivity, there are different types of movements and exercises that typically go in there. So if you're someone who has something going on right now, you'll see different interventions that are commonly prescribed for reducing pain and sensitivity. In physical therapy, these are typically going to revolve around things like soft tissue mobilizations. So soft tissue mobilizations are basically self-massage techniques. This could be with a ball. It could be with a foam roller. It could be with some other tool like that. Oftentimes you'll see um, physical therapists recommend using uh, a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball. There's lots of different massage type tools out there that you can use for this soft tissue mobilization process. We also have just sort of low load mobility exercises. So maybe you're someone who has low back pain and maybe you've seen something like pelvic tilts or you've seen the cat cow or cat camel exercise where you're on your hands and knees and kind of moving your low back from a rounded position to an arch position, just gently moving. Those would be examples of low load mobility exercises. If you have a shoulder injury, maybe you have a rotator cuff injury in your shoulder, sometimes we'll give people these wall crawls where they'll go up next to a wall and just slowly crawl their arm up and down. And that can be a way to not only start working on mobility, but also a way to uh, work on reducing sensitivity in the area. Another one that comes up a lot are nerve mobilizations or nerve flossing. More and more people are becoming aware of these, but we have techniques where we can apply little bits of stress to our peripheral nerves. Maybe it's our sciatic nerve going down the back of our leg, our median nerve going through our carpal tunnel, any of the major peripheral nerves. There are different techniques where we can move the, you know, if it's a nerve in the arm, we can move the arm through different movements and the neck. 
if it's a nerve in the leg, we can move the leg and the low back and um, kind of just work on reducing sensitivity by targeting those nerves at either end. So these types of nerve mobilizations have been shown to be helpful in isolated neck and low back pain. And again, if somebody has pain or symptoms, things like numbness, tingling, lightning bolt type pains, uh, down one arm or down one leg. And then the last one that you'll see are isometric contractions. Isometric contractions are contractions where a muscle is working, but there's no movement. So it might be, you might imagine doing a calf raise and you just hold at the top. So you're up on your toes and you're just holding there. That one is used quite a bit for something like Achilles tendon pain. These isometric contractions are actually used a lot in tendon pain problems. So you can think about jumper's knee, patellar tendon pain on the front of the knee, rotator cuff. Uh, the old term for this was tendonitis. So rotator cuff tendonitis or tennis elbow is a type of tendonitis, golfer's elbow. Um, lots of different hamstring tendinopathies we see. A lot of times in the beginning of those problems, we'll start people with isometric contractions. They're interesting because you're putting stress on the tendon, but we've seen lots of research studies where that type of stress where you're contracting and holding a position can actually have an analgesic effect and help to reduce tendon pain. So those are just some examples. If you're in kind of the acute stages of something going on where you have kind of a pain flare up, these are techniques that you can think about. Obviously, I'm not covering any specific ones right now because it really depends on the injury or pain issue you have, but you're kind of thinking about self-massage techniques, kind of just gentle mobility exercises, maybe nerve mobilizations if it's pain in the neck or the back or maybe a traveling pain that goes down one arm or one leg, and potentially isometrics. A lot of people have tendonitis, tendinopathy type problems, so a lot of times isometrics are a good place to start for reducing pain. Other strategies you might think about that are maybe not specific kind of therapeutic exercises that you get from a PT, uh, a lot of these can also apply to chronic pain. Things like breathing. Breathing techniques have come up a lot in the treatment of pain recently, really just kind of trying to tap into our parasympathetic nervous system and get out of that sympathetic state. So the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight uh, side of our nervous system and parasympathetic is sort of our rest and digest side. And so just kind of taking a deep breath, I probably could do one right now, but just kind of take a deep breath and tap into that parasympathetic nervous system can be a good way to kind of bring the system down a little bit. And again, for people who maybe are feeling a little anxious about their pain or hypervigilant or kind of fearful, or maybe it's just been going on for a long time, this can be a way to sort of help calm the system down a little bit. General movement has a lot of research, just walking. I mean, it depends on the problem, but you take something like chronic low back pain. It's actually a lot of research out there for just going for walks. Um, sometimes walking scores just as well as really specific therapeutic exercises. So that can be a good option. Aerobic exercise has a lot of research, especially for uh, chronic pain. But, you know, if you have an injury that's healing, sometimes people when they're injured would just totally become sedentary. But if you have something like an arm injury, there's a lot of different aerobic exercise options and, and uh, strengthening options you could do for your legs that can help boost blood flow through the whole system and can help with healing in that injured arm. So if you have an injury that's just on one side, it's just in one arm or one leg, I really encourage you, don't forget about you have the whole rest of your body you can train. And a lot of times those type, that type of training, just boosting blood flow, changes that happen in the neurological system can help that injured limb heal. Mindfulness and meditation uh, practices, these practices sort of like breathing in a way can help to kind of calm the system a little bit and get you out of that sympathetic state, kind of tap back into the parasympathetic nervous system, especially for people with chronic or persistent pain. Meditation and mindfulness can be helpful. Sleep, of course, getting enough sleep, that seven to nine hours. Uh, a lot of adults in the U.S., are not getting enough sleep or have poor sleep. And sleep is when we heal. It's when our musculoskeletal system, our pain system, our immune system, nervous system, all these systems are regenerating and healing. So uh, sleep is probably really where you to start anytime you have pain or an injury, start there. And then lastly is nutrition. And I think more and more, you know, I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian, so it's, you really want to go talk with someone to get more specifics on this, but we see more evidence out there relating pro-inflammatory diets to potentially the development of chronic pain. And the opposite of that, 
when you're consuming more anti-inflammatory nutrients. I was just looking at a post today from a friend who does research on the, in this area on how much, uh, how many antioxidants, how packed with antioxidants blueberries are. Blueberries, you know, so it's an example of a food that has a really high anti-inflammatory profile, and it's not the solution. There's a lot of aspects that go into pain. Just changing one thing like that might not totally get rid of your pain, but adding all these things together can be helpful, especially, again, if you're in that kind of chronic or persistent pain situation where you've had pain for six months, a year, maybe longer than that. So just other strategies, I want to put those on your radar. Those are ones that we might talk about kind of just briefly in physical therapy, but they're not the specific things that we are going to prescribe. Usually in the beginning of the PT process, me as the physical therapist, we're going to be more focused on the self-massage techniques, mobility exercises, nerve mobilizations, and isometrics. Now, once pain starts to calm down, then you're going to go on to this phase two where you're addressing impairments. These are the things, again, range of motion, strength, motor control. You have to address these because if you don't, you can have long-standing impairments that can lead to other problems later in life or just reduce your ability to perform your daily functional tasks. The first impairment that you really want to go after anytime you have pain or an injury is range of motion, your joint mobility. If you don't focus on that, you can develop stiffness, you can develop contractures, and depending on what kind of injury it was, you can permanently lose joint range of motion. Now, so this has to be more severe types of injuries. Like if you've had a fracture, if you have a wrist fracture, you don't get moving your wrist right away. I've had patients like this over the years. They end up only, maybe they only get 50% of their range of motion back. So losing mobility like that can really affect, negatively affect you later in life. Other examples, maybe some of you have heard of frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis in the shoulder. This condition is often seen in people who have had a rotator cuff injury and then can can develop if they a lot of people when they injure their shoulder want to hold it like it's in a sling they'll kind of protect it and hold it and when that's done for too long it can turn into this frozen shoulder condition which can take two to three years to resolve so you just really one of the first things we do in physical therapy once the pain is starting to calm down we're working on people working with them teaching them strategies to regain mobility i mentioned some of the within mobility there are sort of different um, strategies, depending on the person's symptoms and what tissue is affected. We have things like passive range of motion. So say, say you had a, a rotator cuff reconstruction. This is one, if you've had surgery for your rotator cuff, a, a surgeon uh, sewed it back together. We often start people with passive range of motion drills where they might use a broomstick or a dowel and they use their good arm to kind of stretch the injured arm. So they're not having to use their muscles on the injured arm while they're healing. So that would be an example of passive range of motion. You're using some external tool to move your limb. This is often done when it hurts too much. Even if you haven't had a rotator cuff tear, you might have rotator cuff tendonitis and just lifting your arm or maybe have a bursitis in your shoulder and it hurts too much to lift it, but you don't want to lose that mobility. So then you use a tool to kind of let that arm relax and your good arm does the work. So these apply to different joints throughout the body. If somebody has trouble bending their knee, maybe using their muscles to bend their knee hurts too much, they could use a strap or a towel, kind of hook it around their foot and do a passive heel slide. We call it a passive knee flexion stretch. So that you have passive mobility. We have active assisted mobility, which typically comes after that, where the person's using part of the muscles on their injured side, and then they're also using the other, the healthy limb. So I might use, if I injured my left shoulder, I might do half of the mobility work with the muscles on my left shoulder and the other half with my right arm. And then last is active range of motion, where you're doing the full movement with your injured limb. So and that's the goal is to get to where you're doing active range of motion and you're going through full range of motion. And there are lots of videos out there on this. I have a bunch on my YouTube channel. If you're wondering what is full range of motion for this joint, you can find those resources. You also can often just compare to your other side. If you haven't injured that side, you can kind of, okay, what does my good arm do or what can my good leg do? And then use that as kind of your goal for the other side. So that's mobility. We're starting there. We always want to kind of start there first. The next thing is that movement control, motor control, neuromuscular control. So looking at how well can you move through different movements. If you've got a, especially with lower body injuries, if you've had an ankle injury, an ankle sprain, you've injured a ligament or your meniscus in your knee, um, hip injuries, we want to look at especially a lot of single leg standing type. First, just can you balance on one leg? 
Can you do a squat on one leg? Sometimes we do step up and step down exercises. There's lots of different exercises, we movements we might potentially test in physical therapy, but the whole idea is just working on move, improving the control of your movement before you start adding extra weight to that. You want to have good sound quality of movement before you start really focusing on picking up dumbbells or adding bands to it or, um, you know, using a machine at the gym. So just make sure your movement, sometimes people skip the movement quality aspect and they um, just start adding strength when they don't have good control. Okay. And then the last part, uh, really when we get to phase three is that whole rebuild capacity. So again, this is mostly going to be focused on resistance training. We're looking at improving tissue capacity. We know that resistance training can improve to, uh, the capacity of multiple tissues throughout the musculoskeletal system. Bone density improves, of course, muscle mass and muscle strength improves. Tendon thickness improves. Even ligaments and the discs in our spine have been shown to become thicker in weightlifters. And those aren't things that you have voluntary control over, but when you're putting stress on the system, those tissues also will adapt in response to that stress. Many of you have probably heard of the, um, the concept of progressive overload, which is just gradually increasing load that's on the system. This is what weightlifters who are concerned about muscle mass and strength and performance are incorporating. They are going into the gym and slowly week to week adding weight to the bar or to the dumbbell. And we see that that can, of course, increase muscle strength and muscle mass. But that can also, you can also think of that principle when you are going through the rehabilitation process. It's just that you're starting at a lower spot on the movement continuum. You, if health, being perfectly healthy is kind of in the middle, you know, when you're injured, you're just a little bit to the side of that and you're trying to get back up to healthy and then performance is, you know, moving the other direction of that spot. So everything's a movement continuum and the idea of overloading your system gradually is a really important concept to keep in mind uh, when building strength. You want to just jump back to the weights you were doing before. You have to realize that your system can become de deconditioned quite quickly. Your body won't waste a lot of energy maintaining muscle mass and bone mass if you're not using it. So just make sure you start out light and just gradually build yourself back up. This is really any good physical therapy program should really focus on resistance training towards the middle to late stages of rehab. And again, you know, when tissues are stronger, they're less likely to fail, even though the body is not as simple as, um, you know, a car or some other machine, it is very mechanical in a sense. And when you strengthen it and put stress on it in graded doses, all of those tissues become stronger. And that means those tissues are less likely to fail when you put mechanical stress on them. So if you've had a muscle strain, of course, if you strain your hamstrings and you build strength in your hamstrings gradually, the next time you sprint or do something forceful with your hamstrings, they're going to be less likely to become strained again or tear. So I think that, you know, that's an area where when I'm talking to patients, that part of rehab makes a lot of sense to most people thinking about the body sort of mechanically and thinking about how becoming stronger can make your body more resilient. And this is just kind of boiling it down to specific tissues. So that's the framework, you know, kind of the basic framework. Like I say that I am all, kind of all orthopedic physical therapists are going through when they work with patients. It's the exact framework that I cover in all the programs in my book. And I think it's a good starting point if you have pain or have an injury right now, or you just want to know what to do uh, at some point in the future when you have another one. Just kind of think about going through these steps, going through kind of, I'm going to think about reducing pain, reducing sensitivity first, then I'm going to make sure I address any impairments that might exist, range of motion impairments, motor control impairments. And then lastly, I'm going to make my system more resilient with strength training, resistance training. If you can have that kind of mindset, it will really give you a good framework, kind of a plan. I mean, like I said, when people come into physical therapy, a lot of what I'm doing is acting as a pain and injury coach, and that's just developing a plan for people so that they, when you have a plan, you feel less anxious about things. And so this will kind of give you a plan for how to move forward. In future solo episodes, I'm really going to dive more into specific injuries and pain issues. So maybe we have a week where we look at sciatica, a week where we look at tennis elbow, maybe a week where we look at a particular type of muscle strain. There are really common pains and injuries that most humans are going to face. And so we'll really get into, you know, what are these conditions? How are they best addressed? And a lot of that, when we look at the treatment strategy for them, is going to revolve around this process, these kind of three phases. So I hope this is helpful to you guys. I hope you enjoy this episode, and I will see you in the next one. Thanks.